Hello from La Hinch County Clare, I'm Rory McKiernan and you're very welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. A special thanks as always to you podcast patrons who chip in to support over at loveandcourage.org and thanks also to all who promote and assist the podcast in other ways. All the support is hugely appreciated. If you're new to the podcast, a very big welcome to you. You have a great episode coming up right now and there's lots more in the archives to check out also. And you can find me, Rory McKiernan, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those usual online places. And my e-newsletter sign-up form is on my website, rurymckiernan.com or you can find it over at loveandcourage.org, loveandcourage.org. Now, My guest in this episode is someone I've been keen to talk to for quite a while. Tara Flynn is a much-loved Irish actor and writer. She's well known for her leadership in the campaign to repeal the Eighth Amendment in Ireland, as well as her various books and articles and her creative productions. She's a real force of nature. Tara is the co-host of the popular BBC podcast called Now You're Asking with Marion Keyes and Tara Flynn. That's something to add to your podcast radar if you haven't come across it already. So let's just get going. Let's jump in without further ado and we'll get started with this Love and Courage episode with Tara Flynn. Hello Tara, you're very welcome to the podcast. You were just um, telling me there, we were, we were setting up the sound levels and you mentioned the guy from the BBC, <laughs> which I took my inferiority <gasps> complex, kicked in immediately and said, well, I do not have the production values of the BBC, but and nor it do did I. remind me. Ah, uh, not at all. Well, you are in that realm now, like, um, you know, your, your, your new BBC podcast and congratulations. Yeah, luckily, I don't have to anything to do with the recording of that. I sit down in front of a lovely mic and our beautiful producer, Steve Doherty, is in the room making things sound good. So I don't if I was let near the production end, I'd be we'd all be in big trouble. So that was it was something I was recording remotely during last summer, during lockdown, literally under my duvet in my bedroom to damp out the rest of the sounds and hoping the construction next door didn't start up again um just all all by the skin of my teeth but so the the lad in London was going yeah was getting me to fix my levels and he had to talk me through it and then he went that's grand and so now visually I just remember what he said to said it and so that's why I went this is where the guy from the BBC said it should be like so it wasn't me commenting on you it was me saying I well, don't know well, what else to do next <laughs> Next time you're talking to the guy from the BBC, you can tell him that the guy from Love and Courage prefers the audio this way or that. Ooh, anyway, I will, look, I will. I, I, this is what happens to me. I go off on one. So, Tara, I was thinking about this chat and I, I sort of feel like I know you, but I don't know you. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, I, um, I feel the same. I feel like I've met you several times, but yeah, we've never sat down and had a, a good long chat. So this is great. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited to get going with this. And um I suppose there's so many directions we could go, but I mean, obviously we'll get to activism, which is such an important part of, I think, both of our, both our lives. Mm. But I suppose I just really start off with asking you, how are you doing at the moment and what are you up to and what's, what's exciting? Um, what's exciting, most exciting at the moment is, I guess, the podcast that I do with, with Marion Keys because we do get to talk in depth about people's problems and very often we share those problems which is we don't set out to solve them from any kind of imperious we know best way we go oh that thing that's happening to you I've done that so many times I have messed up in that Mm. way so many times that's Mm. our approach so and we are both uh, older ladies so uh, we've kind of made loads of mistakes between us so uh, as I think Marion says over 100 years of mistakes between us so it's that's that's one of the most exciting things I've never loved working on something so much it's just a lovely team between Steve the aforementioned producer and Marion it's just a dream job barely call it a job because it's just such a lovely I really look forward to doing Mm. it um and I'm writing a show funny you mentioned activism I'm writing a show about losing my marbles post repeal so Mm. (laughs) it's about grief and losing my marbles post repeal so just about getting back together after all that but uh it was tough and it was tricky and I'm very glad to be focusing more on the art side of things now yeah, I think um, any of that that kind of level of intensity has to come in sort of waves and ebbs and flows and the yeah. rest renewal, restoration, 
all of that. Um, I will return to that, Tara. I do want to uh, zone in on the podcast momentarily. And I'm just struck with that idea of the idea of mistakes, you know, and like, like, you know, by virtue of being alive, we're we're kind of walking mistakes, really, aren't we? Yes, and, I certainly am. You know, you got yeah, my number, and, my brand. <laughs> <laughs> the the mistake queens. Um, yes. but but isn't like isn't sort of implicit in the idea of calling it a mistake? Uh, it suggests that you know there's a stigma around just life, and it's it's almost like the the counterpoint to the perfect life syndrome. That mm. probably afflicts too many people at too many times. That's interesting. I'm um, I'm more talking about things we can improve or get better at because I think we've what we're talking more about how we can all do better, particularly in terms of mm. minorities and the way we speak and how we use our words and all those sorts of things. And for me, that's a fun challenge. It's a great thing to learn. I love to listen and learn a new way to do a thing. So yeah. Um, and if you love words and language, then it's always great to improve your vocabulary and, and make it more usable, make it more useful, um, particularly for the people who are directly affected. Um, I suppose so. So mistakes. Yes. I mean, we, we all mess up and and I don't think we should be very hard on ourselves. That's part of the, the thrust of the podcast is be gentle with yourself because you can't mm. improve if you're beating yourself up. And by improve, I don't mean be a better girl boss and run your corporation better. I mean... Uh, learn from things that don't go as planned and see if it can help you to do better next time. Yeah. And like that, that reference to the girl boss, do you think that that's a a sort of a culture that dominates too often that, that idea of, yeah. It's sort of like, yeah, to, to be a better woman, you better, you better be more patriarchal and that never Mm. really works. Well, so, I mean, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of chatter, too, about intersectional feminism and stuff like that. And it's one of the reasons I step back quite a bit now. If I get asked to do a panel, I try and check out who else is on it and make mm-hmm. sure that people are that there's as many representative people in the room as possible. And I get loads of chances to speak. So I'm very happy to not take that space, especially these days. And. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's it's just something I think we we have to keep looking at when we're when we're propping up the patriarchy and just doing the old things with different faces, um, or when we're actually making some change or stepping aside when we need to. Mm. I think that line propping up the patriarchy could merit a podcast in its own right. In that, <laughs> you know, there's so many facets of of what <laughs> we think might be doing good is in yeah. fact rein, reinforcing the machine. It, it runs deep, you know, and we've been taught it very well and it's quite hard to extricate yourself. And mm. th- that's something that I try to keep questioning now. I was definitely oblivious to it, 100 percent oblivious to it 15 years ago, even. And it's just something to keep interrogating and keep alert for. But I, again, we have to be gentle with ourselves and we won't always recognize it. Mm. And it's just helpful when we point it out to ourselves and to others, I think. And instead of getting defensive about it, just go, oh crap, I didn't realize, or I didn't reckon with that. We, we, we are, we have constant capacity for learning and long may it continue, but that's definitely something I'm trying to continue to keep unraveling in myself because I'm still Mm. oblivious to parts of it. I know I am. Mm. I like that approach. It it strikes me that there's a sort of a a, a kindness and a self compassion that uh, not just a self compassion, but we can be compassionate with each other as we not just dismantle, but sort of wean ourselves off the machinery that is so dangerous and toxic. Even start to see it, because it's yeah. one thing to wean yourself off, but even to know it's there, it's so mm. feels so innate. To so many, particularly mm. when you're uh, you've got a skin color that works across the board or <laughs> a class mm-hmm. background that works for the majority at the top of the ladder, whatever it is. So just mm-hmm. seeing it is a massive start. Um, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. So it's just something to keep to keep pulling away a little bit at like plaster off a wall. Keep pulling a little bit and soon you'll see the lovely stone underneath <laughs> Yeah, That's well, a the, 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 <laughs> what? this this stone image. Let let me stick with that for a minute. Oh, like no, usually, there's a load of wor- worms on. 
Usually a load of worms under a stone or a load of muck, but but maybe that's also accurate in that, well, you know, in my defense of uh, the, the worms and the stones and the muck, um, probably that transitionary process isn't all straightforward and no. can be mucky. And Thanks. also uh, worms uh, often, you know, people sort of balk at the idea of worms, but they're, they actually are fertilizing and mm-hmm. some of the most important creatures on our planet in terms mm-hmm. of renewal and rebirth and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm down with the, 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 the worms in this regard. You know, acknowledging that we have been part of a toxic system. It sounds so huge, doesn't it? Also, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about and I don't, but it's painful and it's messy. So I think the worms are probably a good metaphor, but they do churn up something new and good. Is that, does that work better? Is that anywhere close? I've no idea. I think we're, I think we're there about, next time we've got a horticulturalist <laughs> and a, a, a biologist and all sorts of things to, to, to help us with our, <laughs> um, but when you say, um, you know, it sounds like, you know what you're talking about. Like my feeling around some of this is that a lot of it can be so amorphous that it it, it can be hard to name and frame. Like what yeah. actually are we talking about? Yeah. We're talking about culture. We're talking about systems. We use words like patriarchy. We mm-hmm. talk about capitalism, hyper-capitalism, neoliberalism, all the isms and so on and mm-hmm. so forth. Um, but like, I suppose for me, like to boil it back down, I, I'd probably settle on something like, um, just ways that no longer serve us, you know, in, yeah. in terms of the health of each other and the health of the planet. And mm-hmm. I would like to think if there's any positive to come out of this moment, it's a realization that this shit ain't working for it's most not people. Working. It's not working. So it's like any cursory glance at it tells us that it's just not working for the majority. So it's worth it's worth a look. It's worth a reevaluation. Yeah. Yeah. So like that reevaluation, is that something that, you know, when you talked about repeal and you're you were very much front and center in that movement that did that lead to that kind of level of reevaluation or had you already undertaken your reevaluation of where you were at or, you know, did it was it a, a combination of factors in the mix? One of my favorite sentences I'm going to use now, I don't know. That's a great Mm. question. And I couldn't tell you. It's more of uh, an evolution than a moment. And I think I think something that being, if you want to say front and center, definitely a public face of of any kind of campaign, be that accidental or on purpose, um, because not all of that front and centerness was planned. Uh, I just thought I'd tell a story and that would be it. Um, I told mm-hmm. a story for people who don't know about having to travel for an abortion just to put a human face on it. I had a bit of a platform, mm-hmm. so I wanted to use it for something useful and I felt that mm-hmm. could be useful. Um, but when when you're telling a story, other people tell you theirs and it's a real privilege but you definitely learn, you learn by listening and I'm paid for talking, whether it's into a mic for a commercial or whether it's storytelling for a radio or what, you know, I'm paid to talk. And what's been most beneficial in the last few years has been to step back and listen. And I think that's a space I'm much happier in right now mm. is to, like we said at the beginning, to step aside for someone who hasn't had the shot to speak and needs to be heard and to listen Uh, I think listening, it's just, it's, it's underestimated. It's, it's (laughs) people don't think they feel like they have to come out with an opinion, but actually that's the lead. That's the last bit of the puzzle. And it's the least important one, unless you're directly affected. It's okay to hold opinions. It's great. It's how we, it's how we navigate the world, but do we all need to express our opinions all the time? For me, it's better to hold your counsel unless you're someone directly affected and mm. listen to the people directly affected. Mm. And I think if there was a little more of that, we'd be in a slightly healthier place. But at the moment, that opinion culture is just driving, driving, driving social media. I'm mm. no longer on Twitter and not just because of abuse, which there was and it was pretty severe and constant, but it's not just that. It's just I got really exhausted by that space, that constant need 
to hold an opinion if you don't opine on one thing that means you don't care about it when maybe you're just keeping mm. your, your own counsel that day or listening um, or evaluating how you feel about it. The constant need to everyone, it just becomes white noise, just that constant barrage of here's what I think about that. And even when I was still on there, I used to say to people, maybe just hold off on tweeting about it till you see whether someone else has made that made a similar statement already. Because otherwise it's just a wall of sound. It is just noise and it loses meaning. And so mm. I think, I definitely think that the listening, now here I am in a podcast getting the huge privilege of talking to you for, for a long, good long time. And I do enjoy those kind of chats, but, and I'm very happy to contribute, so don't get me wrong, but I, I do think I'm more useful in the world to listen right now, if mm. that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, a bit of a mantra in our house, which to the point of almost uh, ridicule, uh, we we often end up coming down to the default position of both and, and almost <laughs> therein lies a new podcast name, both and, you know, <laughs> just that <clears throat> I think that world of listening is is crucial um, and <laughs> that that there is a time for talking too, and likewise in the in the realm of leadership to step forward and also to step back. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I feel like I can empathize at, at, a, at a small level of what you're talking about in the, in the sense that there was a time I was living in Dublin and I was writing opinion pieces for national newspapers, you know, a few times a month. And then you get invited onto the radio show and then you'd be on a panel and then you'd be on a conference thing. And at some point you start to have a moment to go, what is the point of all this? You're just yeah. feeding noise. And you know, like often your opinion is allowed 60 seconds or three minutes, but really what's needed are conversations that are explorations and considerations that we actually can dialogue with each other. Yeah. And I think that's maybe a space that has been missing and possibly has led to the growth of podcasts as well. Definitely. I mean, they're so vital. Those conversations, dropping in on other people's conversations, learning about people that you wouldn't get to hear on a, a sound bitey radio show, that having to be slick and sort of media trained and speak in sound bites, as you say, it, 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 it isn't as meaningful as a longer, more considered conversation. And so and it also becomes to the people who do it professionally, it becomes a bit of a game. What am I going to write about this week? I'll find a thing. I'll take an inflammatory stance and then it'll get, you know, clickbait. And I've lost interest. I've 100% checked out of all that. I don't read those pieces. I don't listen to those shows. I, I just, especially not before bedtime. I'm, mm. I wrote about a rage at bedtime years ago in one of my books. I can't remember even which one. Probably um, Giving Out Yards. Don't even know if it's still in print. But yeah, that rage, that rage before bedtime. And it's not productive because you're not changing anything. You're just going to bed raging. And so for me, I'll watch some comedy before bed or, you know, so that I'll get up a little brighter. <laughs> you still, I still have my low level hum of rage at all times. That again is part of the brand. Old lady raging. Um, that's that's part of the brand. <laughs> um but yeah, it's I've checked out of all of that because it's the same talking heads. Uh, talking about things and then congratulating each other for quote unquote staying civil when mm. sometimes I think it's good to get angry about injustice for instance mm. and if you can just switch off and go well I stayed civil about that with someone who doesn't want me to have my rights tra -la -la, yeah. and then we all go for a pint I don't think that's necessarily commendable yeah and, yeah. and it takes up the space of someone who could be there sharing an experience we haven't heard. Instead, it's these professional opinion givers going, bah, 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 bah. ha, 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 let's go for a pint. And I have checked out. Mm. <laughs> well, you checked out of there, but you checked in somewhere else, you know, Hotel Tara and Marion. Oh, uh, not very full <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> not, not a guess. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean by that? Oh, no, I was just running with your hotel metaphor and going, yeah, it's not exactly oh, full. Maybe it's, Air, maybe it's Airbnb. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, it does sound like there's a new wind behind you to some degree or you've created a new wind. Is that is that accurate? I've gone back to I've gone back to where I, I actually work, which is because a lot of people, I mean, 
I never gave myself the name or title activist. I just had a a step forward when there was a story to tell and I Mm. had the position to tell it um, and the experience and also the support of my family, all those kinds of privileges that that not everyone had. And I was lucky, so I was able to do it. Um, uh, And then, you know, being as vocal as I could during marriage equality, when, when people need they needed people who weren't directly involved to stand with. I'm very happy to do that sort of thing. And if if I feel people are being unjustly railed against, I'm very happy to use that platform again to go, hey, that's not that's not cool. Hey, guys, guys, that's not cool. OK, um, but where I'm happiest is making work, is making I'm making a theatre piece at the moment with This Is Pop Baby. And as I say, it is about is about that time. Um, and mental health and grief because I lost my dad just before all that happened. So I was able to ignore oh. the grief until I couldn't anymore. Um, and it all came out together in a lovely bubbling okay. mess. So um, I- I'm much happier and I feel more useful telling those stories. And with the podcast mm. with Marion, we're, we're, life is really hard at the moment. And both of us have spoken publicly about struggling sometimes and we mm. want to give people a bit of a release. We want we want people to come away from listening to us feeling a bit better. We might not have solved yeah. the problem. We are not legal experts. We are not medical experts. And if we deal mm. with anything, even touching on those areas, we say, please talk to a professional about this. We aren't mm. the ones to come to for this. But we want to make people feel a bit better. And that's where I feel most useful right now. Mm. So I love that. Yeah. I love that um, you're both... Um, like you both come across as so sort of light filled people that are oh. are kind of emitting joy, you know, but at the same time, you're you're not unfamiliar with um, getting stuck in either of you. I mean, in terms of injustice, Marion and mm-hmm. yourself and also from the little I know of both your journeys that you've both kind of traveled uh, heavy roads, if you like, yeah. for want of a better term. Um, so that yeah. combination of being able to hold all that together and facilitate a space for other people, for me, that's, uh, there's a kind of a, a church-like quality here going on where, oh, where you're like, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just, uh, is this a <laughs> God, I thought my plaster wall was bad, but no, no, we're back in This is that where one. I thought this was going at all, but uh <laughs> Um, okay, um, so so the, 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 I think the, I think you're I'm, right. I think what both of us enjoy doing with our work is taking the darkness and finding some good in it. Or it, there, that that not I I don't really believe everything happens for a reason. Sometimes te- terrible things just happen, mm, and they're no. awful, and it's un, unfair uh, to to the people that they're happening to. Look at Ukraine at the moment, and you're just like, mm-hmm. and and all the other areas in the world where oppressors are just walking in and taking a big crap all over people. Sometimes crap things just happen. But I think trying to find ways to lighten other people's load is is no bad aim. And even Mm -hmm. if that's light entertainment, or as you said, or delving into some of our own sorrows and saying, I have felt that way too. We're not going to do the Instagram influencer thing of everything is shiny and great because we know that it isn't always for us and it definitely isn't for people listening because they're sending us their problems, which is, it's a massive privilege. It's a massive generosity Mm. of theirs to share. They get, they're completely anonymous. And um, Mm. so they're safe in that way. But it's, it's a real, we really appreciate it and how, what a big deal that is. So we never want to um, portray that trust, really. We, We want to make people feel a bit better. And if we can't solve their problem, we'll at least share how we've done similar or or had a similar mm-hmm. um had a similar time mm. when you say that um you know prior to this that the post repeal campaigning uh emerged in a kind of a bubbling mess i i do have a memory of that time on twitter and it was probably peak horribleness you know it was more than horrible it was it was kind of nasty and violent and like you were getting essentially, I think you were getting threats, weren't you? You know, it was getting very it was, I, personal. It was very personal and it wasn't just anti-choicers. There was just a kind of a glee in it. There was a there was a hobby to it. I really do. Sometimes I used to say in my in the moments where I wasn't on the floor, literally shaking, I would just go because because when people attack you with glee and you because you look back and I remember talking about this 
with a therapist at one point, what could I have done to change the situation? Nothing other than not speak out. Nothing. Because I hadn't attacked anyone. I, mm. I hadn't. I was trying to get back to the kind of tweets I used to do before campaigning, which was funny ones. Just a mm. bit of funny crack. Again, give people a bit of light relief and and closer to my job. And I wasn't allowed to do that. I was just a target. They're just walking around with a target on your back. And people, the glee in it. The glee in it is actually the scary part because I've been a woman in the public eye uh, to greater and lesser extents for a long time. Um, and I, I, I'm used to insults. I'm used to you're shite. I'm, I'm used to all that. So a lot of people try to minimize it and go, is it really so bad? It's just words online. And it's like, well, I'm offline. This is something I'm talking about in the show as well, actually. It's not ready yet, so I won't talk too much about it, but... I'm offline, they're offline, and, and it's still two people interacting. And then when it's masses of people on one person, and it's mm. if it's not your shit, it's like, you should have done this better, or even share my petition. You didn't share my petition. Just that constant ownership and pulling, constant pulling and tugging at your flesh is what it feels like. That sort of, you don't know me, you don't own me. And I can share whatever I want. It can be a feeling, a thought, your petition. Mm. Uh, so it was coming from all angles. It was then sort of, you're doing activism about this, but not about this. That means you don't care about that. I was going, this isn't my job at all. I'm not a politician. I'm a volunteer. And I'm just a person who shared a very private story. Mm. It wasn't necessarily easy. I'm not looking for any pats on the back, but it wasn't necessarily an easy thing to do in the first place, giving up your privacy like that. But then once you've given up your privacy, the ownership in the public sphere is wild. Mm. And the kind of, this is what you should be like, and this is what you should do. And like, I shouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't. You, you, we do not have a relationship. That parasocial relationship that sometimes turns into fandom and sometimes turns into ownership and sometimes turns into vitriol. So it's a very dodgy space. I'm very wary of it. I am on Instagram now. But it's the only place I am. I even took down my website, took down my YouTube channel because I'm very happy to meet people online, very happy to do it. And it's a necessary shop window for work. But I know how it can go. And I know that the more access people have, the more they feel entitled to try and steer you and holding on to who you are is very, very difficult in that moment. And so I lost myself completely. That's the honest truth. I lost every sense of who I was or what I was supposed to be doing in the world. Only that I have an incredible husband who really anchored me and a brilliant family who were behind me the whole way. I don't know where I'd be. Um, and the thing is, people will say, oh, sure, it's just online stuff. When it's at that level, that level of vitriol, that level of judgment, that level of volume. It's very tricky to navigate and it definitely knocked me down and I had to take certain steps uh, to back away from it and to set out again who I am on my terms. And now I'm very quick to just go, no, I'm, I can't share that at the moment. I just can't. I'm not sharing that. I've I put up a, it's in my Instagram highlights, but it's like an, exp like an explainer, like I've had to step back from activism. I'm not a politician. I'm just a person. I'm actually recovering right now, whether people want to believe that or not. Some people will say things like, oh, it's good you had a bit of a break. And it's like, no, I had a breakdown. Um, that I wasn't lying on a, a beach going, oh, that was all so exhausting. I lost myself completely. And so my boundaries now, they had to be built up from scratch but they're pretty strong. And so I may come off and I apologize if I do. I may come off quite blunt sometimes with people or I may come off like like I'm picking and choosing what I talk about. Damn right I do. Mm. Damn right I do. And I, I will forever. <laughs> but but it, isn't, isn't that what we all need? You know, that, that sense of boundary that, that we can't be all things to all people. We're not at the nope. disposal or at the service of everyone. Like it's nope. your own personal sense of self and agency and like yeah. if it, we we close the doors to our house in the morning or the evening like we have that right to close the door at any time to some extent 
Yeah. I think it's important for people to remember, and particularly younger people who've grown up online. I think it's such a magical thing. It's fecking brilliant, the internet. But we need the same boundaries online as off. And if someone mm. walked over to me in a pub and started yap, yap, yapping in my ear about what I should be doing or not, I, I would either ask them to leave or I would leave. Yeah. And I think just applying those same boundaries online yeah. is, is really useful. And yeah. I'm trying to learn <laughs> and yeah. I will get there. I'll try to be less blunt sometimes. But the bluntness comes from defensiveness, from mm. a need to protect myself because I know what happens when I don't. Yeah. I I also came to see a lot of this in the context of a pub and imagining it as a public house because often though we've no determinants as to who's going to be in that place, how much drink they've yeah. had, what kind <laughs> of level of being an asshole. May, and there's always, out of 100 given people, there's going to be three or four. And at what level are you exposed or protected, you know? So anyway, I, th I think hopefully, hopefully, there's an emerging literacy around how people manage themselves in this. I I, I hope. Um, I, I know. Think, I, I think I, a lot of it. Sorry, Rory. No, I, I I was just going to conclude by saying that I I think you know Twitter has its own minefield, and then I suspect that Instagram has a different type of minefield when it comes to you know whether it be my best lifestyle or whatever it might be. Yeah, shininess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the land yeah, I think I think a lot. Sorry, what I was just going to say very, very quickly. I was just trying to chime in with you, and I stepped all over you in, by accident. I'm so sorry. Um, it's, you did not it's, actually. I'm I'm not going to accept that apology because you didn't. Right. There's there's a very tiny lag in our audio connection here, so <laughs> we won't have any apologies on this podcast. No, I have to apologize at all times. I'm always walking <laughs> apologizing. That's another part of the brand. So, um, yeah, I was just saying. Unfortunately, I think a lot of it will be down to personal responsibility, and that's okay. That's okay. I don't agree with um with censoring things, but I also don't think you 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 need to give a platform to hate. Um, and I think if someone is hateful or violent, same as in in the offline world, there should be repercussions for that. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe a limiting of access is it? I don't know. I don't agree with censorship, but I, I I do think there has to be some kind of repercussion for for violence, as you say. And and I think that that but then some of it then is because the the big platforms won't act in a certain way. That, that's that's OK in a way. That's OK. So long as we have our boundaries clear and that is some somehow down to us. And then you can also choose just not to be honest. And a few people did say, oh, you're, you're running away. And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not running anywhere. <laughs> I'm making a decision. I'm uh, reviewing everything. Wow. I'm making an informed decision and I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm wondering like who are these people that that have all this life advice because it's like I'm you're running away I'm <laughs> running away from you that's where I'm running <laughs> it's yes yes no thanks for thanks for letting me know that this is exactly what I need to do yeah no it's um it's wild uh, it, it but it's part it, because people would just come up to me and say these things like again Rory honestly it's very hard to describe that public ownership part mm. that that mm. people grabbed. So I'm much happier now for people to meet me through the podcast or mm. meet me through my curated Instagram, which is mainly the dog and the cat, um, unless I'm mm -hmm. having a good hair day. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah, <laughs> because I don't want to well, inflict my regular hair on people. <laughs> uh, aside from the uh, the dog and the cat, there is a, another person or a character that makes a regular appearance, and that is your your wonderful husband who you, you mentioned there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Carl, he's great. He's just been, I mean, he's just been so great. Can we have, like, I, I won't I won't bother to introduce kind of music into this part, but can we just have a little Carl tribute moment here? And uh, yeah, ta ta sure. yeah. <laughs> Carl, this is for you. Um, Car Carl, can you tell you're me? So great. You're really, really great, and you make me smile when I'm sad. <laughs> there you there, go, Carl. You got your own song. jingle. Horrible, um, can you tell me where you met Carl and and how your adventure together began and what it, some oh, of the highlights God. along the way? 
I've told this story loads of times, so apologies if your listeners are listening again, but he was actually on a date. Carl's American. He was on a date. We were both living in London. We were in a late night bar in central London and we were both at the bar ordering separately and we got chatting and um, he took my number. He was on a third date with someone. It wasn't going great. And I thought, well, now, isn't this isn't that a typical American now? They're dating all around them and I'm not exclusive. And I'm, I don't think I'm interested. I still gave him the correct number, though. And when he called a week later, I was like, oh, I'm kind of excited. <laughs> so but I, he met me at a very guarded moment in my life. So I made the poor man work very, very hard uncharacteristic for me, <laughs> but I was trying to I was trying out those new boundaries, but in the wrong direction, it turned out. So it's it's all learning, it's all worms, it's all trial and error. Um, so uh, he persevered, thank goodness. And like I've just, I've just never been in a relationship like this before, and I just adore him. And I don't care if I sound sappy. I adore him. He's hilarious. He's so solid. He's, you know, he's he grew up in South Los Angeles. He's African American. Very different background and story to mine rural West Cork, well, outside Kinsale, but still rural and the gateway to West Cork. Um, I'm actually in Kinsale now as we speak on down with my mum. And um, so a very, very, very different background, but a year apart. So we have a lot of similar cultural like movies that we grew up with and music that Mm. we grew up with and that sort of stuff was a great common ground. And then we were both both, uh, foreigners living in London so we had that shared as well. Mm. So then um, after about a year and a half, we got married in Hackney Town Hall and then we moved back to Dublin and and the rest is him picking me up off the floor post repeal. <laughs> mm. So uh, he, was, I, I was, there ever, was there ever a moment there where, where L.A. was going to be a possibility? We've talked about it, but the way America is at the moment, uh, particularly for black people, it's mm. just not somewhere we're drawn to right now. That said, I'm going mm-hmm. in a couple of weeks and I can't wait. I love America. I'm so sad about where it's at. Uh, but mm. I'm sort of taking my lead from the American I live with. And he's deeply sad about it. Mm. Um, but it's stuff that's always been there. It just seems to be bubbling up in a very overt way. And yeah. that's that's horrific. But he's there at the moment and he's so happy to be home. He's a very proud American, you know, so he's very, very, very happy to be home. And he's been to In-N-Out Burger already, so he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Carl, I think we're going to have to leave your tribute slot here if you are listening, um, uh, but we will uh, perhaps consider a full Carl episode at some stage in the future. He's much more interesting than me. This is the problem. He's way more interesting. So when people meet him, they're like, oh, a friend of mine invited me to something yesterday. She went, Don't forget to bring Carl. And I'm under no illusions like that. Yeah. He's the much, much sunnier, the actual sunnier, fun, more fun easygoing, breezy person. I'm trying to learn from him and he will tell you, like you say, you say about myself and Mary, we seem light filled and joyous. Uh, With Carl, it's actually true. It's really like it is with Marion as well. But there's a real I feel like that that rage that I talk about bubbling that keeps me from being as sunny as Carl is. He doesn't have the rage, you see. He doesn't Mm. have that rage. (laughs) Mm. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, that I I do admire. I I do sometimes wonder certain people born with that sort of disposition, you know, I mean, there's many influences, obviously, in terms of family and culture and life and experience. Yeah. But um, but yeah, all hail the the Zen sunny people of the world. It's really annoying, but he is that is who he is. It's so <laughs> irritating. The way you say it's annoying. <laughs> it's really annoying because I lose the head. I just go, where are my keys? Yeah. Oh, my God, my keys. Ah, it's going to be a disaster. And he's like, did you check your coat pocket? Oh, yeah, they're there. There you go. And I was like, God, God damn it. So even when really Lovely. terrible things happen, he's so sanguine and he's so calm and it just things get sorted out better. So I'm trying to learn from him constantly. Mm. It can, is there any chance he'll get like a little slot on the podcast with Marion? I would love it. He came on <laughs> when I had my own podcast and I've taken that down to Taranoia. He came on that. He did. Um, we talked about uh, racism and internalized racism and stuff like that. And and obliviousness mm. to racism that that white people in in our comfort and and we're, we're just oblivious to a lot of a lot mm-hmm. of things and just trying to tease a bit of that out 
So he's he's been on a couple of podcasts and he's I think he's a great guest. He, he's not a very public facing person. He's a TV writer. He prefers to be behind the scenes, which is gas because he's much funnier and cracked to be around than I am. So mm. it's a it's a terrible injustice on the world. But that's them's the facts. Yeah, it's it's often the way, you know, with the the let's say the less public people, um, they they get on with it, and he, as you said, he's he's writing other characters and stories in his own yeah. way. Um, you mentioned you're in West Cork now, um, so your well, your gateway, mammy gateway. is important to clarify. The gateway, the gateway. okay, yeah. the border yeah. of yeah. The, not officially West Cork. Actual gotcha. West Cork Import- kill me. Important clarification there. So, mm-hmm. so your mammy's there, yeah. And are you staying in your childhood bedroom kind of thing? No, no. Is they that, moved no. in from. We were out the countryside when I grew up. So they moved in after we, after myself and my sister, went off and were doing our college and adult things. They, um, they moved into town. Um, and so, yeah, right in town. And that's for me, having grown up in the country, the novelty still of staying, staying inside in town is just mm. brilliant. <laughs> I still get that feeling like, oh, I get to stay inside in town. So, yeah, it's very nice. Brilliant. And um, I'm sure like it, it's it's been an important time the last couple of years, spending time with your mother as well after your your father passed away. Um, yeah, you... uh, and and of course, as for everyone, the last couple of years have been so tricky with the pandemic and not seeing her was very, very hard. But she took to technology like a duck to water. We were so lucky with that. And so we were able to FaceTime and, and Zoom and all of those things, which really helped. But it's not the same as being here. So I feel really lucky. Yeah. Would you mind sharing some of what it was like to grow up uh, in 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 that area and what what your yeah. folks were like? And but it was it was lovely. It's a lovely place to grow up. So we came to school in town, went to the convent, and it was there was no public transport for primary school. And then there was the school bus. So sometimes we took that. And when we were older, we had our bikes. It was four miles. So once we got, once we were allowed to ride the bikes into town, that changed the independence thing completely. That was so great. But it felt sometimes like you'd go home and you'd be quite cut off. But the trade-off was there were always loads of animals. We didn't have a farm, but we had tons of, like the garden went on forever and there was a couple of fields out the back. And so by times we'd have a a horse or a donkey, three cows, a goat, like we just, and I just adore animals as a consequence. And we were, so that was the trade-off. We couldn't just finish our homework and go and play or, or go meet somebody without a load of advanced planning. But the trade-off was just a kind of idyllic amount of furry creatures around. (laughs) So that was, that was really cool. And what what was your um, <clears throat> like, say what you were like com- becoming a teenager and what s- sort of personality or interests were unfolding? Wait, was the mm. kind of comedian sensibility coming into play, or an artist, or a mm. writer, or were actor? You shy? I wanted to be an actor. Okay. I wanted to be an actor from the time. I, now I'm really really shy, but I fight it. So that can come off as quite quite brash or quite. Um, it seems like the opposite of shy, but internally I'm very shy and I'm always fighting it. I always have to take a deep breath before I go into a room of people, especially people I don't know very well. But I always knew I wanted to be an actor. Um, I was a very intense kid. I was an intense and quite depressed kid. So co- comedy wouldn't have been on the horizon at all. Um, I loved to sing, but I didn't think I could. In fact, I was just thinking <laughs> I auditioned for a panto here in Kinsale. In my teens, uh, the Rampart players, they're still going. And uh, I auditioned for it and I, I put down Can't Sing on the on the form. And then I ended up getting, so I was saying, we're really sorry, no, you can't sing, could you? And then it turned out I could sing, but I had just convinced myself that I couldn't. And they were going, why didn't you tell us you could sing? We could have given you a different part. And I was like, because I can't, because I can't sing. So I do try and push myself to sing a bit more. Now, I, I sang in college and stuff. I used to busk and... I sang in bands and things, but so definitely singing and music I was absolutely obsessed with that and reading mm. and yeah, going off into other little worlds. And I think that's why I love now. I love writing. I love thing I love with acting is becoming another character and and getting to 
build a different world or take people to a different place. Storytelling is now one of my main focuses, be it on the podcast or in the theatrical pieces I make, which are, they're autobiographical, but they're, it's trying to build that world and take people there and let them feel something. Hopefully, mm. hope sometimes it's laugh, and they, because I, I've worked a lot in comedy, but I I found it a bit restrictive. First of all, I again like with the singing, I don't necessarily find myself funny, so <laughs> it just sort of happened, and so I'm happier to let the work be what it needs to be. And if that's funny, great. And if it's not funny, I'm not chasing that laugh. So that's definitely, um, it's opened up the work in a different way, and I'm enjoying mm. that. So. Let's see where that takes me. <laughs> Was there Let's ever see. a time at which you sort of strayed into the normal job world and or, you know, were you did no. you always kind of take this path? Yeah. <laughs> No, I was lucky enough to go to UCC. So I did loads of acting there. And basically the day I graduated, moved up to Dublin and I had, I think I had 30 pounds in the bank and just started working odd jobs and doing things like I would do stage managing for theatre. Um, just anything to keep me involved or get me to know people uh, just to be in that world. And I was very lucky that basically the second year of doing that, I was doing things like schools theatre, which was great. So get a, that was a job that went on for a year. Um, but you're getting up at four in the morning to go and perform at eight in the morning, but it's still brilliant. You're acting and it was it was fantastic. And that sort of led me into comedy world because I'd love to give a shout out to the amazing Michelle Reed. She was in that um, schools tour as well. And she was she was starting Dublin Improv at the time. And she encouraged me to come down and take some workshops and then met other comedians. And then I ended up being in the Nulas. And so everything happened by accident, but mm. but just trying to stay involved in that world. And then I started doing lots of voice work and that paid the bills and just diversifying in that way. So you're not just doing one thing. You're not just going, I'm holding out for theatre. And, and that has kept me going. So I, I was talking the other night on Women's Day, I was talking about redefining what success means mm. and for me it means I've been able to stay in or around the work I always wanted to do yeah sometimes it's writing sometimes it's uh performing sometimes just whatever it needs to be sometimes it's more commercial and I have to just as you say you know you have to bite the bullet sometimes and go I need to be paid so I've just managed to stay in it and the average in this business the average time before people do lapse and go on to something else is six years. So I've been at 31 and yeah, at 32 in June. And so I consider that a success. So I might not be headlining stadiums and my books might be out of print, and but I'm still here and I'm very, very, very happy and lucky to be here. I love that. I love that. Um, it de definitely sounds like you have a, a great sense of gratitude. I'm imagining that Huge. the 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 recent times and the the turbulence that you went through probably added to that. Is that fair? Yeah, it was like starting from scratch again. There were lots of projects that I wasn't, you know, that people consider you too radical or that you are or people like people think you're a journalist now or, or something. It's just very strange. So I, again, that's on me. That's for me to go, no, I, I'm setting up the boundaries again, but that means digging the whole bloody foundation again and building them up from mm. scratch. So I'm just trying to, I'm turning down things now where it's overtly political or a talking head or anything like that. I'm just like, no, that's not what I do. That's not who I am. Who I am is this weird little creative person over here who wants to make people smile. And I'm going to mm. just focus on that now however that comes up and hopefully some paid gigs and all that will be great. That's fantastic, Tara. Like, I, th I think it's a great way to wrap up because for me, what I'm really hearing from that is this kind of, uh, I know <laughs> the word journey gets a hard time, doesn't it? But uh, <laughs> anyway, in, uh, I, I've actually started replacing it with voyage, but it's the same thing. But Listen, you know, we're on a journey. <laughs> it's a, good, it's a useful word. We're on one. We can't help yeah. it. There's a beginning, a middle, yeah. and an end. And we're on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, and there definitely well. is an end. You know, yep. well, there's there's oh, rebirth yeah. and all that as well. But we we won't 
get there for now. But um, <laughs> but this this idea of like saying no and really being clear about who you are and what you're about and what you're not about. And I think if we could all do that and remind ourselves of that, we'd all be in a much better place. You know, it's just coming home to yourself to, to a large extent. And accepting when other people tell you that that's that's I can't do that. I that that's not who I am. So a little generosity for ourselves and for others. And I think I think we'd at least we'll at least have more clarity. And I could certainly use that. Yeah. Amen. I shall say amen at the Church of Tara and the Church of Marion and Egg. Oh, you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> just, I'm so, just remind so everyone that where, where to get the podcast and all that kind of crack. The podcast is on BBC Sounds, wherever you are in the world. And it's called Now You're Asking with Marion Keys and Tara Flynn. And I'm on Instagram at Tara Flynn IRL. Is it in real life or Ireland? That's up to you. It's Tara Flynn IRL because Tara Flynn was taken. Ah. Oh. Well, fair play to the other Tara as well, getting in there early. <laughs> Quick off the mark. Oh, you. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Emil. Hello, Ruri here again. Huge thanks to Tara for that conversation. If there's anyone you think might enjoy this episode, please do consider sharing it with them. And if you want to support the podcast, you can chip in as a patron over at loveandcourage.org and be sure to check out the archives of other great episodes that you might enjoy. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, here's to living life with more love and courage.